Hello, everyone, and welcome to my new podcast, Still Standing. You may know me from my podcast, Magic is Real, or you may not. Either way is fine. If you are a Magic is Real family, thank you for being here. And if you are new, welcome. I am so excited to be launching this podcast called Still Standing, in which we discuss overcoming obstacles and challenges, coming out on the other side, healing from trauma, with a focus on progress, not perfection. Um, I don't think anyone comes out of trauma with like some, we're all perfect, but I really think that it's the insights that we glean from our struggles that are so valuable. And in my spiritual opinion, it's why we're here. It's we're here to learn. We're here to grow. And uh, unfortunately, if everything were smooth sailing, there wouldn't really be a purpose to be here. So I am so honored to have with me one of my all-time favorite people and my dear friend, Garrison Starr. Garrison is a musician, and I was thinking of putting up a clip of her music. No, there's too much of it to ch just go check out Garrison Star. I'll hold up. We'll have links below. I don't understand why you're not a household name by now, but you are doing very well. You are very successful. You are very well uh, known, and also everybody loves you. And so welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today, Garrison. Shannon, I'm honored to be here, excited to be here, happy to support, and you've supported me and so many of us over all these years. So I love you to death. I'm excited to, to chat. Too. Me too. So Garrison is here to share her story and insights. I am very aware uh, of the your healing journey, but I don't know all the details and I'm really um, excited to hear. So I would like to start by telling us a little, about little, tiny little Garrison. Who were you then? And um, start anywhere you like, anything that you're willing and comfortable to share, I'd love to hear about your background and, and really who you are and where you come from. Oh, wow. All right. Well, I um, originally was born in Memphis. So I grew up in North Miss Mississippi, but it's the Memphis area. Um, I grew up evangelical Christian in an evangelical Christianity. Um, and I struggled, I had a struggle with that. Um, I loved growing up in the South. Don't get me wrong. I really did. Um, but you know, I was outed when I was in college, uh, by my evangelical friends and then was ostracized by that same group. And so uh, my, the biggest part of my story, I think is just, you know, little Garrison grew up so pure and excited and joyful and, you know, then was abandoned by the people who were supposed to love her. So it's funny cause I'm revamping my Patreon page. I'm making some changes and I'm going to release the gospel truth album exclusively to Patreon. So I've been doing a lot of work on my page, kind of just like, there's like an about this artist on the front page of the Patreon page. And that kind of stuff has always been really hard for me, you know, to just to go through all those details and just be really, you know, diligent with what I want people to know and how to, you know, making sure that everything that's up about me represents who I am. <laughs> I don't know, you know, that's part of my journey uh, in my healing journey is really taking ownership of my life, uh, you know, and so anyway, I guess, uh, you know, a lot of my journey as an artist, I was just revamping that, the front, you know, kind of bio section of Patreon. So I've been writing about this for the last couple of hours. So it's fresh on my mind. Um, but, you know, so I was outed by the mosquitoes are so bad here, by the way, I'm just telling you, I don't know what it's like where you are, but I, it is fucking awful. So, you know what, like Garrison's in LA where I'm from and I'm in Arizona now and we did not have mosquitoes. I mean, I was there yeah, 25 yeah, years. We didn't, when I first moved here, we didn't have yeah. mosquitoes. You know what I'm saying? We um, did not. But it, anyway, so if you see me swatting at invisible things, it's mosquitoes are so bad, but so anyway, so grew up in Northwest Mississippi in the Memphis area, you know, grew up in church, grew up in evangelicalism, knew I was gay from a super young age, ended up being outed. And, you know, so a lot of my journey as an artist really has been like just trying to unravel all that trauma. You know what I mean? Wrestling with um, the rejection of the people who are supposed to love you and, you know, being told from the very beginning that something's wrong with you because of this part of you and it was interesting too, because I was just writing, doing some like free writing about how much I resent having been put in a box in the first place, you know, like 
I remember thinking when I was outed and even before I was outed, knowing that, you know, that, that, you know, people were, that was going to be a problem at some point, you know, that I wasn't going to be able to be a Christian or be in that community and have that life without, you know, changing myself, becoming straight or just, you know, whatever. So, um, so yeah, I remember thinking way back then too, like, why do I have to be put in a box? You know, I mean, I lost my narrative pretty early on, which is something that I'm, you know, dealing with. Um, but you know, I loved growing up in the South. Part of the reason why I've started kind of digging back into some of my soul for soulful roots and some of this gospel stuff is because, you know, I kind of felt like I had to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, because of what I went through in the church. Um, and now I've realized that I actually don't hate everything about where I'm from. I, I'm not sorry that, that I'm from the South. I just, you know, I just got really hurt and have had to spend a lot of time healing from that. Um, yeah. And, and like, you know, still very much in flux with the healing journey, but you know, right. I don't know yeah. that, that stuff, that part of my story is fresh on my mind just cause I've been writing about it a lot today. So please feel free to ask for any clarity on anything. Yeah, I'm going but, to, cause but I, I am Southern. I am definitely very Southern, but I think a lot of people, let me just say this one thing and I'll shut up. It's funny because I feel like a lot of people don't know that much about me. You know what I mean? And a lot of people don't even know that I'm from the South or they think I still live in Nashville or whatever, you know, but I've been in LA since 1998 and I love it out here. Yeah. I remember I was actually thinking about, I moved to Virginia for two years during the pandemic and yeah. then I, I was planning to move to Nashville and then got diverted and came to Arizona, which I'm so thrilled about. I love it. Yeah. South, yeah. I want to talk to you more about that, but yes, the South, that's probably not for your podcast. <laughs> I know we will. The South, <laughs> I love, I went to school in Virginia. My dad's from Virginia. However, and as there, there are problems with all places. I mean, I live in the most beautiful town, Prescott, Arizona, and it is also um, not the most diverse place I've ever lived. Um, and yet yeah. it is the most beautiful, spiritual. I found my tribe. There's beautiful people here. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you are a minority in any way, it may not be the most comfortable place for you to exist in. Um, so I, too, love the South and I love Nashville. I had the best time visiting. And I know when I saw you there, we discussed this because you were saying to me that you grew up there and you had moved back there. And mm -hmm. then you decided to go back to L.A. And because it, you just feel more comfortable because I don't want to put words in your mouth but accept it sure um so I'll just kind of start by also asking you um can you give us some examples of what kind of treatment you received coming out as a gay person or even just in general or kind of messages that you received from the church that I'm not putting down the church either I'm not trying sure. to like I just want people to know that there's no you know I'm not judging yeah. a particular religion <clears throat> as much as there are some sects of every religion that can be uh, difficult and, and that can sort of indoctrinate people into some very damaging um, belief systems, I would say. Yeah. Well, and I would agree with that. And I feel like, you know, there's, it's funny, you know, evangelicalism, you know, that very conservative legalistic brand of Christianity, that country club, broham Christianity, you know, that is very much, you know, that is very much the brand of Christianity that I grew up in. You know, it's, it, it, you know, it's so binary, you know, and it, I mean, when I was in college, I had a sorority sister of mine take me to the top of our dorm room. I, I'm sorry, the top of our dorm building. There was the roof at the top. She took me up to the top of the roof of the building and said, if you don't stop this behavior, don't say I didn't warn you. You know, it was oh, wow. things like that, you know, then to turn around and have, that entire group, I mean, I mean, you know, Ole Miss is 85% Greek. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I would, me and my girlfriend at the time would walk into a room and people would leave, you know, they had been wow. instructed to, they had been instructed to give us tough love until we repented from our sins. So there was no communication. Like if we walked up to a friend to say, Hey, how's it going? Like that person would walk away. You know what I mean? Like we were very, humiliate. I mean, we were made an example of, you know, um, and, and, and told, you know, look, you either change your ways or, you know, you can't, you can't come around, 
You know what I mean? You can't, you can't be a part of this thing. You know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, you're sinning. We don't, it's just not right. You know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we were very alienated. It was, it was alienating. You know, it was, it, it, my, the message that I received was, you know, change your ways, get right with God, you know, get rid of this gay stuff and you can come, you know, you can be a part of our community. If not, you know, you can't be, you're just not welcome. You know, you're not one of us, you know? So, um, I mean, that's, that's the message we received at that right. time in and the nineties, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know it's, but we're this, we're around the same age. And, um, I, I mean, I, I didn't experience that myself, of course. Um, but, but I, and I didn't really see very much of it, but I know that it, it definitely was a more, a different time. And, mm -hmm. uh, we have come still not all the way, but such a long way, but I do, I would love to know, what was it about? Well, first, I just want to say, like, what was it about the church that did resonate with you or the religion that mm. did resonate with you? And how did you reconcile? Like, what parts were you able to hang on to, if mm. any? Or did you just have to abandon all of it? No, that's the thing. You know, like, even when I was young and I heard them, I heard people talking about different people that they thought were bad, you know, I just kept thinking, like, this just doesn't sound right. Like, this doesn't sound right to me. Like, I, it doesn't seem right to me that just because I might be gay, you know, that shouldn't mean that I can't have access to this love, you know, that people are talking about. You know what I mean? Like, or, or have access to love or worthiness in general. Like, from just even from a religious standpoint, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why would, why would God want that you know why would these messages you know the bible the old testament the bible a lot of the bible was just so convoluted it was like why is it so complicated why do we have to try so hard to understand what they're saying i don't resonate with this like i never resonated with it but what always resonated for me was a power greater than myself you know i've always believed in what i would call god but i just never believed in it you know in that god having like a man's face on it or you know, an ex member of Leonard Skinner, you know, like fucking Leonard Gen Skinner Jesus. That's in every church where Jesus is this white dude with like flowy carpenter hair. You know, I don't believe in that. That never resonated with me. It never made sense to me, you know, why everyone should have these really specific labels like a lesbian or gay or like, you know, why does it have to be like that? I just, I never understood that, you know, yeah. but what I, what resonated for me about, the church was the singing you know the community singing the connection that everyone felt through the music and how emotional that was and connective that was and then also just the general message of love you know this general like just sort of spiritual wavelength like i've always resonated with that but it was the you know when it started getting very specifically hateful is where i that that's what I didn't ever trust about it. And then of course, when it turns on you, you know, it, it becomes like a, a whole different thing, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that's the problem I have with it is just no, my understanding of God is God is love and that we're here yeah. to love and yeah. who you love. Is it a love? I mean, love everybody. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. You know, it really shouldn't matter. I'm, I'm of the same mind. I just think it doesn't, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, that just doesn't seem like in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't seem like that would be like the thing, you know, that Definitely would be separating not. you from like, you know what I mean? That just doesn't seem like that would be the thing. Yeah. Especially again, I'm not trying to push my, I, I have to remember on this podcast, I'm, it's not, you know, my other one's spiritual. So I'm trying yeah. not to be preachy at all. Um, oh, I'll, feel dude, my way, yeah. I'll feel my way through that, but the my understanding is that um yeah we're here to be love to be of service to love one another and to learn to negotiate our differences with love and compassion and unfortunately it can get very skewed so yeah um as you i guess i'm going to say as and i know that a lot of i guess my question is so much of your music has evolved um and i'd love to know how that reflects a lot of the the sort of like when you first started writing, because I know that you're kind of talking about sort of really getting to know yourself authentically and like having to um, re sort of having to like, I guess, 
I don't want to put, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of get to know yourself as you're healing in a different way. And so I'm interested to know sort of how your music and that have fused or how your music might have changed and grown as you've changed and grown. I love that question. I really appreciate that. You know, and it's funny because I was just writing about this too. I feel like, excuse me, the record. So I feel like for many years, I was putting the cart before the horse. You know what I mean? Like I wanted this validation so badly from, from people, you know, from the industry. Like I felt like, I felt like I had struggled so much releasing the first like few records that I released on a label. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways I, I did, I feel like I sabotaged, I self-sabotaged a lot because I didn't know any better. And I was also thrust into kind of an impossible situation because I had all this trauma and, you know, self-hatred and confusion and identity crisis and all this that was so fresh and raw. I go from, I mean, for lack of, uh, sorry to use like a million metaphors, but like going out of the pot and into the frying pan with like, you know, the same wounds getting exposed and then exacerbated. You know what I'm saying? The, you know, because the, the rejection that I experienced in the church was also the rejection that I experienced in the music industry. You know, the truth is when I got my record deal, it wasn't like they were like, Hey, be whoever you want. You know, it was, we can't have you looking like one of the Indigo girls, you know, and listen, a lot of the things that they were saying to me um, from a marketing standpoint, not the Indigo girls part, because it's like, you know, they're two of my heroes. And also, you know, they were being incredibly authentically themselves and it worked out just fine for them. So, you know, I never agreed with that statement, but I guess I'm saying no one ever sat down with me and said, you know, like the Indigo girls identity is their identity. You know, if you know them, if you've been around them, you see that who they are is who they are. That's them, you know? So nobody sat with me and said, Hey, you know, what do you like? Let's go find you some new clothes. Let's go get, you know, I was literally at that time of my life, just grasping at straws, which is just something I've been taking, um, you know, a look at lately <laughs> in this spiritual work, the journey that I've been on. You know, it's like going back and remembering things and journaling and just working through all these old feelings. It's like, you know, and unraveling all this old stuff. Um, you know, I wish somebody had just sat down with me and said, hey, listen, you know, whatever you want to be, whoever you want to be is okay, but let's channel it. You know, let's let's refine it. Let's talk about it. Let, you know what I mean? And I don't know, maybe that's too much to have expected. But looking back, it was just like, I just didn't have really a mentor figure. I didn't trust my parents because I was angry at them for, you know, some of the things that had happened and ways that I felt that I hadn't been supported, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I was defensive with these people not knowing exactly who to trust and having this record coming out and not wanting anyone to, to change me or adulterate what I was doing or what I wanted to say. And, you know, so, um, you know, the first, that, that first like 10 to 15 years were really hard for me. You know, I took on a lot of bitterness and anger and I've had to really kind of work backwards from there, you know, realizing that what started my entire career and my journey as an artist in the first place was, what I had to give, the story that I had to tell. And I think I lost sight of that. In, in my own estimation, I lost sight of that along the way, you know, um, really trying to be validated because that was important to me. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, that's not how you go about getting it. You know what I mean? It, that resonates so much. One day I'll, I'm going to do my own episode where I tell my story. So I don't mean to make it about me, but I do like to relate. Please. Because yeah. I want to talk about that because <clears throat> I was a child that was, a, um, I had a big birthmark on my face. Kids made fun. People pointed and stared. I was very, very, very sensitive. So I shut down and stopped speaking for three years as a way. Really? So that people wouldn't look at me. So I would say, you can't see me because, you know, when kids. Where was their, the birthmark? It was on my face right here. So I'll have, I have a scar right here. Yeah. And, I wondered. Yeah. And that's uh it was a big birthmark, like this big. Now everybody would 
remark on it or and and yeah. not not always cruelly but little kids would call me duty face and things and so Ew, I yeah. didn't know when I was little that I was just a pretty little girl who happened to have a birthmark on her face and um I completely and this and yeah it's getting to a bigger question for you uh and so I internalized that and I stopped speaking for three years so then I was even weirder Ugh. so I had yeah. no friends except Tina and Tamara um and I they were my neighbors and they're still friends of mine they were the only kids that just didn't see that and then Adele my friend who's still my friend who said Aww. when I had my birthmark removed she goes why why do you have like bandages on your face and I said I had a birthmark removed and she said what birthmark huge birthmark she loved me for me and so yeah, I think crazy. even though I come from this most loving supportive family they had me in therapy they're still together and happy it doesn't always have to be family of origin you know it was it led to an adulthood of sex and love addiction because mm. I was seeking validate I never I thought I was ugly because at two years old you're ugly you're ugly you're ugly we're born pure and loving and trusting mm -hmm. we're born loving everybody we're born um, loving ourselves and then when you hear and I'm not even blaming anyone it's just part of the world yeah you to internalize that and you think I am ugly I am the birthmark I am this so I grew up in these just finding my feeling alienated I isolated um quite like shut down so I did a lot of work around that but I wanted to talk with you about that because I think it's it's one of my passions is to is self-love is how do we find mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and it's an ever-evolving journey uh and I would love to, and I think it's it's so heartbreaking that the world breaks us I mean you're just this beautiful little child mm -hmm. and then you receive these messages you're not enough you're weird you don't belong you you you're defective in some way and you're an other you're, you're an, an other. other you know that's a big one yeah and so how are and I'd love to hear about kind of your journey and and like how you are finding your way back to loving yourself unconditionally and celebrating the beautiful unique human that you are and any and bring up any obstacles um too that you might or struggles what are your resist what's your resistance to that anything you want to speak to about that um well let's see uh what do you mean what is my resistance you mean do you resistance? well I guess I want to say like how are you working through that and finding self-love but also what resistance might you come up against as you're doing the work where sometimes we're like I still am struggling with that aspect I'm still struggling with self-love and acceptance mm -hmm. if there are well, some, I'm, yeah yeah well I'm definitely always struggling with it you know I've gotten back into therapy I got into some EMDR therapy which is what I started the best somehow yeah and I I have manifested sorry I had manifested <laughs> therapy and it's free like somehow my insurance is paying for it I can't explain it it's the only good thing wow. that I've discovered about my health insurance is that they are paying for this therapy so it's exciting because you know we're this is what I'm loving about this specifically the EMDR EMDR thing is that it's targeting you know the old patterns and the old loops that we get in which is really to me I just feel like I've been in my own way for so many years I've just continued to repeat the same story over and over again that something's wrong with me I'm not good enough I'm too much of this I'm too much of that I can't have what I want I don't deserve to be happy you know and you know the way I kind of describe my journey or at least where I am in it right now is that you know I got to a place where I kind of removed as much of the hair from the drain as I could on my own and then now it's time to get a snake down there you know Drano mm -hmm. does Drano you know and Dayquil Nyquil all that stuff it does treat the symptoms and it does a great job but then if you want something more effective and you want to get under the surface and really under the hood of the thing you got to call somebody who's got a tool that can help you get you know down to where you need to get to so I think that's you know the therapy is my next step in just my healing process I mean I've done a lot of it on my own but I, the last couple of years especially really digging into a daily meditation practice and forcing myself to practice new behaviors you know um and being backed into a corner in a sense where there's nobody else to nobody's coming for you you know what I mean nobody's gonna come over and you know do your work for you that is not a thing 
And so how much longer am I going to sit around and wait on something to fall into my lap? You know what I mean? That's just, I mean, how much longer am I going to keep doing the same old stuff? So, um, you know, I have found the, the guided meditations and the, the daily sort of, you know, for lack of a, uh, a better way to say it, because I hate this word, but like the devotional times, you know, like the morning readings and the medita- the morning meditation time. That's a better way of, of saying it, because I don't read from the Bible or anything like that. I just have a couple of like, actually, one of my books is an Al-Anon book called Courage mm-hmm. to Change that I love. I love it. Too. And then do you and then another one is The Language of Letting Go by Melanie Beatty, which can sometimes get a little Christian-y, but so can 12-step stuff. Yeah. You know, it's really funny is 12-step stuff can be super Christian-y, gaudy, you know, when it shouldn't be. I mean, they refer to God as him all over the fucking literature, which I hate. But Yeah, you know. they, it's funny because I my whole life has been changed by 12-step, but I was in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. And mm-hmm. um, so it's a different, well, so it's a I'm much no more- no stranger to that shit either, yeah. let me just tell <laughs> you, you know? I mean, that book is more modern in its wording than- the the AA book and even the Al-Anon book, which, you know, it was like written in like the 50s. And so there yeah. is a lot of that in there. And um, the it is 50s, one of, a great era. A, for great, a great era. So you <laughs> will find you just kind of have to make it your own. And I remember going in with resistance because I didn't I wasn't religious. And mm-hmm. for the record, you do not have to be. You can be a complete atheist. But I remember what they said. It, the one thing that struck me is it you don't have to believe in this deity you just have to know that you what what you're doing isn't working and you are not in control here and yeah you know even if you get over give it over to a doorknob give that power like it's See, better yeah that's interesting to me because i i honestly don't know how i would approach it's funny to me that you were talking about your friend who was a christian and then became an atheist like i don't know how you would go from that that's an extreme leap from one extreme, not one extreme to the other, but to go from believing in a power, excuse me, greater than yourself to believing in nothing, nothing. You know, that's, that's, I mean, I can't get behind atheism. I just can't. I mean, I don't judge anybody who's an atheist. I just don't understand putting energy into believing in nothing. That just to me seems, I don't get that. But, you know, some might say, well, you know, you were, traumatized and completely emotionally abused by the church why the fuck would you choose to believe in god great question but i've just always believed in something greater than me i like the idea of living in collaboration Mm. you know and, and as i've grown spiritually i've realized that you know even in christianity jesus isn't coming in and like cleaning up your shit no you still have to do your own work i mean just because you're saved or whatever, just because you're working in conjunction with a bigger power doesn't mean you don't have to do your part. You know, on the contrary, it's like, that's, I don't know. I've been thinking about that recently, just like what it means to really be in collaboration with, you know, other things, collaboration Mm -hmm. with your, with your spirituality. It's not, it's not somebody coming to serve you with a silver platter. It's like, it, it is what you, you get out of it, what you put into it. I feel. Yeah. And you've been, publicly on your social media uh, mentioned really having to come to terms with your anger and Mm, mm -hmm. learning to, I don't want to say release it. You can say how you feel about it, but um, maybe to live alongside it, maybe to manage it better, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on anger. Gosh, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I, I feel like it's funny because in therapy today we were talking about some of the statements like targeting statements like thinking about certain statements that bring up that are triggers for us and being too much is definitely one of my triggers you know and and specifically being provoked and then called out for being angry you know it's like totally being provoked reacting and then being gaslit about my reaction you know that's a big thing that's happened in my yeah history, you know, um, you know, I think anger can be polarizing. I think anger is important, but I think anger has to be used. Uh, I don't know. I think we have to be cautious with anger, you know, um, because I think anger can burn bridges. 
I think anger can block us from opportunities and anger can be a self-sabotager for us, you know, I mean, for, for, for people, you know, at least in my own experience. Um, I think it's important to, to acknowledge the anger and to find healthy ways of releasing it. But I think, you know, being guarded uh, with that anger is smart, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd love to hear your hot take on ways that we have to still feel the anger and acknowledge it. As you said, it's not something to stuff down. That's worse. No. How do you kind of, what are some coping skills that have helped you? Um, Exercise for one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Exercise is a big one. I think writing, whether it be songwriting or free writing, journal writing, um, uh, essay writing, whatever the, whatever the writing medium is, I think writing is good. Talking to people, you know, finding a friends that you can talk to and unload on, um, you know, and having someone kind of walk through the anger with you, I think can be helpful. And then, you know, sometimes just sitting in it and acknowledging it, you know, and, and as you said earlier, walking alongside it and not trying to condemn it or shame it, but just being like, yo, I mean, it's, it's, you have to work up to that place, but it's like, you know, befriending yourself and walking alongside yourself. I mean, you know, some things are worth being angry about. I just think if I'm talking about, if I'm thinking about my own experience in ways that I feel like maybe um, I've let myself um, kind of wear my emotions a bit too much on my sleeve, I think I can think of situations where that anger didn't serve me in that, Mm -hmm. in a certain, in certain situations, you know, because it wasn't, because it wasn't a safe place, you know what I mean? To be angry. Does that make sense? You know, you're not, you know, because I think growing up, uh, growing up in a, in a uh, kind of, I want to say strict, but my parents weren't strict, but I feel like this brand of Christianity, it's not strict. It's just rigid, Mm -hmm. binary. You know, I think growing up in that, environment um there's a confessional aspect to it tell me if this makes sense to you um you know i when somebody asks me even to this day uh how are you doing it's like i feel like i have to give them the most honest answer possible (laughs) you know and that's not always appropriate there's nothing wrong with that but i have literally been in situations where someone's asked me that and it, you know, and I've seen their face go from like, hey, how you doing? How's it going? To like, huh. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, hello. Sorry. I got to take this. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's just not, <laughs> you know, it's just not always, it, it, you don't always have to confess everything you're feeling and thinking to, to just anybody, you know, and it just part of the immediate, what's coming up for me immediately in thinking about all this is just, you know, that it's okay sometimes to keep some things for ourselves, you know, and until it's safe or right to include someone else. And I, you know, in thinking about back about my own, you know, journey with sexuality and how all that stuff unfolded for me, you know, it, i never felt like it was okay for me to have anything that was just for me, you know, Except for music, except for my music, I guess, you know, like I was able to write poetry and songs and be honest to a point in that stuff. But even that, I didn't feel like I could really be open with what I was thinking and feeling, you know, I didn't feel safe even then to say exactly what was going on. You know what I mean? And I think that's, I mean, you're, you're just so charming anyway, but I feel that's (laughs) part, part of why we connected. I've known you for 20 years. A, sort of God, dude, um, can you yeah, believe know. that 20 years dude I know I think and look at we still look the same yeah, um, we do. yeah we do and I do think because I had to learn that too in 12 step which I'm still very open wearing my heart on my sleeve are you sober I, um not well from you know sex because I was got never, it. okay a you said you were else LAA I got yeah, you. yeah, yeah so yeah. I was never a drug addict or anything like or I didn't or I'm not didn't addict I wasn't addicted to alcohol. I'm a, I was addicted to unavailable people and Dude, validation. Preach, preach. I probably should have, instead of, I mean, I probably should have been in SLA to, to be honest, but I did find my way to Al-Anon, which I felt like, it I feel like of, everyone, 
could benefit from Al Anon. I do you too. I, I mean? think I've always said I think every human being should do the twelve steps. I agree with you. I mean, yeah, I agree with you. But but there are but I mean back to what started this little tree branch of this conversation was it is interesting thinking about twelve step in terms of you know giving your care giving your life over to a doorknob. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that is yeah. interesting when you think about the twelve step. Something that triggers me to this day is the guy, you know, is the gender of the God stuff and sometimes how they talk about, you know, in this kind of that condescending Old Testament shit. They were just like, ugh, you ruined it. You know, if my yeah. mom sends me a Bible verse, it's like, oh, you ruined it. You ruined it. I was happy to text with you, but now you <laughs> sent me a fucking Bible verse. You're trying to relate to me with the Bible. I'm over it. You know, it's like, exactly. you lost me. You lost me. Yeah, exactly. And I do think um, I was also going to say that one of the most beautiful, well, one of these, the gifts of healing and um, learning boundaries and learning oh. what to keep for yourself and what, because that's my, boundaries. was a huge issue for me, boundary issues. And, but what's so, but what I love is that because you and I, you've just said it are this way where we wear our heart on our sleeve, we're able to, through the work, figure out how to retain What's beautiful about that? I mean, yeah. you're one of the most open, honest, like I was just telling Garrison, a lot of people are like, oh, please don't banter on stage. But when Gan <laughs> when Garrison banters, <laughs> it is, first of all, there's some real profound shit in there, but there's also this like hilarious, but just this, what's funny is that you're being so honest and you're so relatable. And that's what make, pe makes people love you. Not just, you know, this is the most incredible musical show. It, I mean, like musical performance, oh. but then also I love you because you just share your heart. And so I think it's really awesome that we can learn to retain what's good about that, which is we open yeah. our hearts. We connect easily with people. We're very honest and it may, and yeah. disarming. I'm going to say disarming. Yeah, and yet, that's a good word. Because you're very disarming. And I know, I mean, I have to say, I know I am. And I think that, um, but it is so important what you said about just choosing who and what, who you share with and what you share, because not everybody might be ready for it or in a space to receive it. And it's actually might be putting a little bit too much on people um, when they're just not comfortable. And I know I, I definitely used to make people uncomfortable with how well, but I was, yeah, but even more than that, because I feel like, you know, that's not really, I don't, because I, I hear what you're saying, but I also want to push back a little bit for yeah. us both and say yeah. that it's not our responsibility to try to figure out what somebody's going to be comfortable with or not. Yeah. I just feel like for me, you know, I was more concerned with, you know, being honest for what, you know, for, for not the right reasons. Instead yeah. of being protective of my own peace, of my own uh, security, you know what I mean? Of my own needs. Like, I, that's where I'm coming from with it. Where it's yes. just like, you know, where it, I I was so concerned about what I was about giving the right answer. Do you know what I mean? Or like mm -hmm. doing the doing the thing I was supposed to do in that situation where I didn't, I don't know, I kind of betrayed myself. Does that make sense? I feel like it's like a betrayal in a way of just not, of just like, okay, whatever. I'll just deal with it. I'll just put myself in whatever scenario and just fucking deal with it, you know? Yep. And also, and I think too, that like, when I say like someone might not be ready to receive it, so I guess I sh can also amend that to say they might not be able to be supportive or they might not. And if right. you're okay with that, right? if you're ready for someone to, you know, then- Great. But if you're really not looking, if you're looking more for yeah. support, you just got to be careful who you're sharing it with. It, it just totally. depends on what your motivation is. So I That's think totally checking right. our motivations. I also would love you to touch on um, just in case people don't know, I'm very familiar with EMDR therapy. It mm. one of my best friends has been her, her she has PTSD and her life has been just dramatically transformed by it. And I would yeah. love to hear to kind of talk about what it is, how it works and how it's working for you. Well, the thing that I was drawn to, so I, you know, have been manifesting, I've been manifesting getting back into therapy for a year, you know, about a year ago, I was like, okay, how am I going to do, you know, cause therapy is very cost prohibitive. Yeah. I mean, I don't care who you are over time. If you're paying 
a hundred. I mean, for any decent therapist, you're going to be paying a hundred ish dollars a month, you know, for, to go to therapy. And then, you know, that adds up over time, you know, that just or does. in a week. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cause it, so really, if you're going to get the benefits out of that stuff, you're going to want to be going weekly because you want to work it out. You know, you're yeah. trying to do some, this specific work. So about a year ago, I started manifesting therapy and I found, I, you know, I asked a friend of mine who's a therapist and I told her, you know, look, this is what I'm looking for. You know, I, I need to like really deal with some of this past, the trauma from the, from, you know, it, it's sexual trauma, you know, it is, uh, you know, religious trauma. I've got to, you know, my own internalized homophobia. I mean, I need to like, there's some stuff that's really fogging my shit up. You know, and I, it's time, it's time now I'm ready to like start unraveling this tangle, you know, some of these tangles, I guess. So, um, anyway, she said, you know, I think you would really benefit from EMDR because as, and I'm new to it. So from what I understand, it is reprogramming. So you're going in and targeting certain messages, certain experiences, certain memories, and literally rewiring your brain, re like telling a new story, writing a new story around these, the, you know, for better, for lack of a better, I mean, for a very surface way to explain, it, it's like acting as if, you mm-hmm. know, you're telling yourself a new story. And every time you want to go to the, well, I'm a failure. No, you know, every time you have an opportunity, like even for me on this Patreon page, I have the opportunity to curate exactly what I, how I want to tell my story. You know, and so to me, that's what a lot of this therapy is, is going in and healing some of the hurts so that they're not just, you know, continuing to uh, inhibit our growth. You know, they're like little cancers, little cuts. We go in and heal the cuts. You know, that's that's how I see it. And, you know, the first few weeks of it were kind of tedious because you got to go in and it's called resourcing you know, and you go in and you, you write down like all the things, all the ways that you, all the tools that you have basically in your toolbox, whether it be physical or emotional, you know, do I have friends to reach out to? Who are they? You know, uh, do I have an exercise? Do I have things that I like to do exercise wise that would be helpful? You know, do I have something to read? You know, do I have meditation in my arsenal? You know, what are the things that I have in my arsenal so that if the emotions get too big, or, you know, stuff starts coming up and it's overwhelming, I have these tools to to deal with it. Because, you know, it's it's intense. You know, it is intense. I mean, even when we were just doing, like, the resourcing, I had, you know, I would leave the therapy and over the next week I would have a range of emotions that would come up and, you know, dreams and things, you know. So it's like you don't even realize that that it's working you know, or that it's stirring things up, you know, you don't really even realize it until you kind of get into it. But so far, I really like it. It feels focused. Yeah. And I also, oh, no, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. All I was going to say, sorry, all I was going to say is it feels more focused than just going to talk therapy and not knowing like what your end game is. Like, it's like getting on antidepressants and having a psychiatrist who's like, yeah, we'll, we'll stay on these for like two years. And then we'll talk about weaning off once you get through the thing you're dealing with. It's not like this lifelong it open-ended you know thing which i like we have something specific we're working on i'm not trying to be you know talking about talking myself in circles like i was when i was younger because i did a lot of therapy when i was younger and i didn't get anything out of it yeah because i wasn't invested in i mean i don't know i just i wasn't invested in the same way yeah and i and i uh from what i i think therapy is great it's good to have support but from what i understand and have witnessed it really is not, in fact, uh, some therapists will say, we're not even going to, this isn't like a talk it out situation. So right. we can talk about it only in as much as it helps us um, for today's uh, sort of focus task, like you said, because what yeah. we're doing is we're rewiring the neural pathways in your brain. So it's actually a physical process in right. addition to, and I've done, I've done it myself. Um, every therapist is different where it's like, she took me back to a time that was painful. And then she's like, now we're going to reimagine it. And it's going to be, right. instead of being the rejected child and sitting alone in Montessori school, you're joining the, the crowd. And then as you do them, you can do like tapping. Um, and it sort of yes. reroutes the neural pathways similar to when you have PTSD, your brain is going um, in a loop. It's, it's, it's 
warning yeah. you, danger, 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 danger. It's yeah. supposed All to help the you. Time. Yeah. But we need to rewire it so that PTSD isn't actually a disorder. It is a totally normal survival instinct and a stress response that your brain is trying to protect you from. So it's trying to protect you from future harms. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't walk around like that always on high alert. And <laughs> right, so right, right. the EMDR- Not sustainable. Not sustainable. So the EMDR kind of tells your brain, okay, you can- we're going to interrupt the cycle, this loop, interrupt the loop, interrupt the loop, whether it's like physical touch, eye movement, rap, uh, mm -hmm, eye movement mm -hmm. therapy. And so yeah. actually, I'm no doctor, but I, I believe, and from what I've seen that um, it's really the only thing. I mean, not that, tr not that therapy isn't great, not that TMS therapy sure. isn't great, but sure. something like that is the only thing for trauma therapy, because you can talk about it, but your brain's going to still be looping. Well, looping. and- and see, that's the thing. I realized in my early 40s, I was like, wait a second. I, it didn't even occur to me until then that I had even gone through trauma. Yeah. You know, I, I just, because it's, you know, because it's emotional. And mm -hmm. you think, well, I mean, how bad really was it? You know, and it's like, well, it was bad. You know, it was fucking bad. And it's affected your whole life. And it's affected your, the way that you interact with the world. It's affected, you know, the way you've presented yourself and the, the kinds of situations you've gotten into, who has managed you, you know, the relationships that you've allowed yourself to get, you know, it's like, it's everything, you know, but I just didn't, I never realized that it was, that it had been PTSD or trauma. Yeah. You know, I just didn't identify it like that. And once I did, I was like, okay, well, you know, like I said, if you've got a clog in the drain, you call a plumber, you know? Yeah. If you, if you have PTSD, you need to do some kind of, of, like you said, rewiring and interactive therapy in order to heal the shit or else it's never going away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I love, this is a big overarching question and it's just, it's just whatever comes to your mind. Yeah. I do this on my other podcast too, is if there's really one thing that you want people to know from what you've learned, mm. what is it? Like what, and it could be more than one thing, but just kind of riff mm. on that if you would. Man, I think it's that nobody's coming for you, you know, like the, the, just take ownership of yourself and your life and be the best, like find your, find your thing and be the best at that thing, you know, really give everything you have to that thing. You know what I mean? Like find your thing and honor that thing and really yeah. stick to it. Not that you can't branch off from it, but you know, so much of the time in reflecting, you know, I would get out of my lane because I thought, well, it'd be better to be in this other lane because they're doing this over here. Maybe I should do that too. But it's like, well, but, but nobody else can do this thing that you're doing. And mm -hmm. I, and you know what I mean? And if you're just trying to do what they're doing, it's like, what, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that really happiness and, and fulfillment, you know, that's an inside job. And, you know, sometimes we want something so bad that we can actually push that thing away. You know, I think there's a, I think the secret to life is accepting life on life's terms. I think that really is the secret, you know, like really being able to accept life on life's terms. It is what it is. You know, everybody hates that statement because it's true as fuck. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. It is what it is. And, you know, I just wish, um, you know, when I was younger, but you know, it's interesting when I, I I'm going to, I'm about to say that. And then I'm like, well, what do you wish that you would have known a lot more stuff? Like, I mean, I did the best that I could do, you know? Um, I just, I think I wish I had, you know, some more mentorship, you know, I wish that I'd had some people that I trusted that I could have, that could have advised me a little bit better. But anyway, the point is nobody's coming for you. And you got to do the work yourself to make the life you want, you know? Yep. You got to do that. Nobody's doing that for you. Nobody's ever going to do that for you. You know, you wait around on that. You're going to wait around indefinitely, you know? I love that. And my last question, Garrison Starr. I feel like Barbara Walters. Garrison yeah. Starr. Wow, 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 wow. Today, do you love yourself today? I do actually. Yeah. You know, I think for the first time, uh, maybe ever mm -hmm. wholeheartedly, 
you know, like I can see the light at the end of that tunnel. You know what I mean? I mean, it's funny because today I had to reach out to somebody and just leave. It's not even a big deal, but I had to just reach out like on a business level and say, Hey, I have a deadline. I need you to step up and respond to me. And I was so nervous about getting a response. And I just sat with that. And I was like, what are you nervous about? Mm -hmm. You did your job. You took care of yourself. You have nothing to be nervous about. And I just, you know, again, started reflecting over how many times in the past that I'd been so afraid to step up for myself. You know what I mean? And now that seems ridiculous, but it is part of the process to learn, you know, how to advocate for yourself. And I think especially as a female, you know, I think especially as a female, it's harder, you know, it's harder for a million reasons that we all know if we're female, it's tough. So thank you for saying that. But I do. But I do, I do love myself today. I do. And I'm making different choices as a result of that love, which feels good, which I know you can relate to. I can relate so much. And I'm so glad to hear that. Um, sometimes it takes half a half a lifetime. Um, I literally just said to someone very close to me that uh, I said, you know, I am in a place where I feel like I've been reborn. Like, Yes. Middle-aged. And I, I, the reason I'm having so much fun is that I'm doing all the things that I did, but I'm doing them now from a place of self-love. And it's like, I'm like a kid in a candy store. It's like, it's all new. I understand that. And you know, my whole thing too, is like, finally, and I feel like, again, I'm seeing the light at the end of this this tunnel too, but it's like, you know, the shame. I saw something on Instagram I think it was on Viola Davis's page. I follow Viola Davis. Me too. And she posted something from like a psychiatrist or a a therapist or something that was like, let's talk about, you know, being a middle-aged woman in your late forties, having not accomplished anything you wanted to accomplish or not being where you want to be kind of grief. You know, that's the kind of shit that, you know, that's some real shit that you can't know until you get to that place and have to reinvent yourself or really have to, you know, get busy with it, you know, you don't, you just, you can't know until you get there, you know, how that's going to feel or what that's going to be like. But, but yeah, but to me, like the excitement that you're feeling is infectious and I'm starting to feel it too, I think, but I had to get over the initial feelings of like, wow, that sucks. You know, I wish I was 28, not 48. It's like, well, what does that mean? You know what I mean? What the fuck does that mean? When you were 28, you were on the road with Steve Earle. So what the fuck, you know, what are you talking about? You know? Yep. Yep. I love that. And I love that. I think that's another, that's such a good topic. And, um, that I hear from all my, I mean, mostly my female friends too, that, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we get, we're afraid of aging, but really I feel younger than I ever have. Cause I'm not carrying the weight. Totally. So Dude. that's why when I see you and I go to yeah. your shows, I'm the most excited person in the room just because I'm feel so connected and like alive because I never had that experience mm. of doing all the fun things, but with this like lightheartedness. I mean, my like ex-boyfriend with presence, yeah, kind of, yeah, my I know what you're would say that I was like the lamest, most boring person you'd ever met. And um, it's not his fault, but it's like after we broke up and I found my kind of self. I don't like, like that dude. <laughs> I I won't bash him at all, but I will say that um, you know, it's like he's probably surprised to see like what fun I'm having, you know, because it's like you were always in bed by nine, you didn't want to go out, and now I'm just like, woo, like I'm like a kid again. And it's, it's because so I finally feel comfortable in my skin and love myself, like and like myself. And, and you can't manufacture that. Right. That's the thing. That's the thing you've always wanted to get to, but you had to get to it when you were ready to get to it. Because the more you try to get there, the the, the more you're prolonging the process. And you, you just don't know that yeah. until you can see it, you know? And that's Sometimes why it no takes regrets. a long time to see it. Yeah. 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 We can't yeah. wish because we just didn't know. And now we, and, and we'll, there will be more to be learned. I am so grateful for this conversation. Well, for our friendship. Me too. Most of Me all too, our friendship. Me too, Shannon. Because I always say about Garrison, like, to people behind your back, if I speak of you, I, I I say that just knowing that I have people in my life, and I say this of 
and, and like Chris Pierce is one of those people too, where it's like, Ugh, um, just favorite. these people that I have in my life. I'm like, if these are my friends, I'm doing something right. Um, and right. so we may be imperfect and we are all struggling. We're all human and quirky and weird. But, um, at the end of the day, like we can learn so much from each other, be inspired by one another. And that's what I hope to do with this podcast is to let people know that, Hey, we all, we've all been traumatized at some point in our lives, but don't give up like there. It's like that uh, campaign of it gets better. Um, yes. I'm not going to promise that you won't lose people you love. I'm not going to promise you won't get sick. I'm not, pro you know, any of yeah. that, but I will promise that you will get better and better at navigating the choppy waters of life and that you learn to sort of in a Buddhist way, sort of swim with the current and just kind of, if that's it, what you want, if, if that's, that's what, what you want, you want. Yeah. Yep. getting, getting to the flow state, that's the whole thing. Yeah. You said it, you know, being in the flow state, that's where we're trying to, that's where we're trying to get to, you we know, are. those moments of being in the flow, I think is, you know, it's just like in golf, that, that shot that keeps you coming back, you know? Yeah. Oh, maybe oh. I could go pro. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, Garrison Star, thank you for joining me today. I love Thanks you. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Uh, my love pleasure. And I'll have Garrison's links below. I'm I'm not kidding when I'm telling you. It's it's not one of those things where, oh, she's my friend, so I recommend her music. It's like get to a live show when you can, get on her mailing list. It's church. It's like her shows are magic and like the soul and the the voice and the songwriting and the play just the whole thing it, you are one of the most talented people i know and the most lovable people i know so what an honor and thank, thank you sis you. love you love you